Northwest Strength Science debut podcast episode, and boy, am I excited about this. Debut episode, numero uno, and we're ready to get it in the books. You know, today there was a little bit of news, and when I say today, I mean a couple days ago, but there's a little bit of news with Greg Glassman. Greg Glassman, he's the creator of the CrossFit brand. You may have heard about it. If you haven't been living under a rock, you, you just may know about this thing called CrossFit. Well, he's made a little bit of news. He's made the headlines. And I'm just going to read the headline as is from CBS. Greg Glassman, the creator of the fitness regimen CrossFit, didn't become one of the most powerful people in the fitness business by being coy. On Sunday, 60 Minutes, the brash executive behind the largest chain of gyms in history calls for the sale of CrossFit's partner brand, Reebok, from its owner Adidas to someone young and fresh. Wow. That's Greg Glassman, CrossFit founder, telling Adidas what to do, or at least giving him some advice, giving him some business advice. Is he out of line here? You know, I don't know that that's really my place to, to comment on it. A lot of people really either they, they love Greg or they're, they're on the other side of it. They're, they don't like him too much. Me personally, I, I think he's interesting. I don't really know a whole lot about him. I know that a lot of people dislike him, though, and like I said, a lot of people really like him. You know, I'm an NSCA guy. That's the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And they're in a little bit of a lawsuit with CrossFit right now. And, you know, so a lot of NSCA guys are, are really going anti-CrossFit. But, you know, for the better part, I, I've stayed out of it. And I bring this to your attention to get you thinking. What, what do you think about it? Give me a tweet at C. Lincoln Evans on Twitter. That's at C. Lincoln Evans. Lincoln spelled just like Honest Abe, the president. So go ahead and give me a tweet. But uh, we're going to get the show rolling, and we got a guest, special guest today. We got Brandon Smitley. Brandon Smitley. This guy knows a lot about the strength and conditioning industry. He wrote a great article on, uh, I believe it was EliteFTS.com. And he wrote a lot about, you know, getting an exercise science degree, the highs and the lows, going into the strength and conditioning profession. And we're going to pick his brain today and see see what we can can muster up for you guys to have a good podcast. So stick around, and I'm going to see if I can get Brandon Smitley on the line. Northwest Strength Science, CE. All right, Northwest Strength Science listeners. Now, I hooked a big fish for this debut episode. I've got strength coach Brandon Smitley on the other line. Brandon, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. The sun is shining in Southern Oregon. How's it over where you're at? Um, just wrapping up a evening over here, Midwest. Uh, actually, just finished training actually about twenty five minutes ago or so. So, are you now training for yourself? Or are you uh, for other people? I was actually training myself tonight. So I have a uh, um, a couple people come live with me in the garage a couple times a week. So we basically got a little powerlifting crew. We train Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. But evenings usually during the week because of work schedules. But uh, early afternoon on weekends. Oh, I, I see. I see. Now, you, do you ever, when you usually train uh, for yourself, do you train before you train other people, or is it usually after? Uh, during the week, the way I have it set up, we we usually start rolling around around five thirty. Uh, I usually try to take the bar around six o'clock. So um, I usually kind of have that blocked out for me. Uh, if I need to move it around for clients, I usually can. But the people that I work with, I tend to be more in the morning, or I have them on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. So that's why the Tuesday, Thursday works uh, really well for me. And then the morning clients, it obviously doesn't matter. Oh, all right. Awesome. Well, Brandon, I had you on the show for a number of reasons today. But what I really wanted to talk about was an article that you had written called The Uncertainty of an Exercise Science Degree. Now, in this article, you basically talk about, you know, the highs and lows, but mainly the lows of doing an exercise science degree, and particularly as it relates to the strength and conditioning field. When I read this, I, I was really, you know, moved by it because it was exactly what I was going through. I had just got done with my degree in the very end of 2013. I had just got my CSCS, 
And, you know, I felt on top of the world. I, I don't know if by around what time you had got all that done, but do you just remember that initial feeling of, you know, graduating and getting that first certification? Yeah, I actually got my, my first certification I got was my personal training certification. Um, I got that when I started training people at Purdue University where I did my undergrad. Um, that's a part-time job. So that was my, that was my very first training job. Um, I basically went to like an in-house certification to kind of learn things, but also, you know, getting a degree, I actually understood stuff already. Um, but they helped me take the test and went through some basic training. And that's where I first started training people was at a recreation center at Purdue. Um, so that was a good first learning step. I um, mean, you're not, you're not getting paid a whole bunch. You're getting paid more minimum wage, but certainly not to what like high end trainers are. Um, so that was my first certification. And then as that degree rolled around and I graduated in December of 2011 from Purdue, um, I went ahead considering where my, um, my lease was with my apartment. Um, I basically lived on campus and worked continuing at the rec until that spring, other than spring of 2012. And then um, that's when I basically started looking for some, some internships. Um, and so I didn't even get my CSCS until later, um, later on after, after I graduated. Oh, okay. But, you know, that feeling of coming out and really getting out there and ready to tackle the world, and it's, you know, I, I don't want to say that anyone steers you the wrong way, but, you know, there's not really an advisor in the American school system, in my personal opinion, that's ever going to tell you that, hey, you really, you know, they're never really going to tell you straight. They're always going to tell you the upside of everything. That's their job, right? Uh, but, you know, in this article, you discuss basically what it was going through. You graduated. You couldn't find work. So then you thought to make yourself more desirable, you'd get a master's. And it's funny because I remember the exact moment I thought that same thing. I just could not find a job. So I'm thinking to myself, all right. I got to get a master's. I got to make myself more desirable. It's exactly what you said in your paper. Walk yep. us through getting your master's and then exactly what happened after that. Okay. So, um, yeah, to finish off that undergrad, uh, you know, I had that semester off and I was working at the, um, the university part time. And then I did that internship and I said, couldn't find a job. I actually did find a minor job where I was contracted out of places about 45 minutes away from home where I grew up. Um, However, the pay was not good at all. So, like, the, the amount of money I was spending on gas was very hard to justify the means, but I was still doing it. Um, you know, the way I looked at it is, you know, to get better, you gotta, you got to make sacrifices. That's definitely one thing in this field that you've got to be upfront with and realize. But um, that it was – at least I was having an income and I was still training people. That's what I enjoyed doing, so that's why I did it. I even got to be able to bring my own clients in. And the ones that I didn't bring in, the ones that they gave to me, I would make a percentage cut, you know. Um, and I ended up working there, and I decided, well, I'm going to do my master's, like you said, so I could be more desirable. That started in January of 2013 and at Indiana State University. And my master's degree is in physical education with uh, coaching emphasis, and then I basically went that coaching emphasis more towards strength conditioning, so some of my classes were more based on strength and physiology where you know some of the other coaching majors may be looking more at um the actual sports psychology of actual coaching so it depends on kind of what you wanted to use it for um so i wrapped that up i basically did some summer stuff with it that summer of 2013 i did the best internship by far that i've ever done taking the most away from i interned with um great olympic weightlifting coach and lifter himself will Fleming at his place at force fitness and performance um, and to do that, I actually had to work full-time at Lowe's, uh, 40 hours a week. I basically worked every morning, and then I worked basically every weekend. Um, so I almost worked basically seven days a week. A lot of, a lot of six, but a lot of seven days a week um, to afford my gas, to drive an hour and 15 minutes one way, four times a week to intern. Oh, my God. Um, and then that's, that's the point. Like, after that summer when I realized what I took away – I was like, I got very fortunate to, one, be part of the internship, and he even offered me a position at his place after that internship, and I was, of course, in grad school. Well, I had just accepted a GA position at a Rose Holman Institute of Technology through ISU, so um, my schooling was through Indiana State. My graduate assistantship work that I did was out at Rose Holman, which is a Division three school, 
um, very technology-based. There's no arts or anything like that. It's basically all math, science, and engineering, one of the best engineering schools in the uh, country. Um, and so I had to decide, you know, right then and there. I was I had just forked out one semester's worth of grad school out of pocket. Was I going to want to do that to finish my degree, or should I take, you know, take this um, this tuition waiver and then the stipend to get my master's, so I don't have to worry about that debt, and I still get the education. So I I actually turned down the job position that I was offered to finish my master's. Um, in hindsight, I, I probably should have taken the job. But I took a lot of valuable lessons from the graduate citizenship itself. And like I said, I completed my master's right. um, that following. So, I mean, it was a really tough thing that I, you know, I was looking for a job. And I, I had found one, but um, the thing was that I got to schooling for free, and I didn't know if I would ever get that opportunity again to where I felt like I could probably end up getting – I'm going to end up getting a job again in my life, but I'm just necessarily going to get a tuition waiver and stuff. So I, I have to take that and finish that degree um as well and then ever since then um uh, i've still technically been looking for a job but i've actually been making my own job which i can tell you about here in a little bit oh awesome yeah and definitely we need to get into that but you know one of the things i want to touch upon when you said just drive into lowe's you know working seven days a week the big thing and what kind of opened up a little bit of a storm on your article if you remember i think in the comments was the yeah. subject of the internship. And in this field, the world of strength and conditioning, largely 99.999 repeating, these are unpaid. This has been a big deal because it's hard to, you know, how many of us really have the time to work for free? Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very tough. And um, I definitely understand the side of it. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'm definitely not knocking that. Um, it's just that for many people, it, it can be very difficult. Um, I would say that I don't even know if I address this in the actual article itself, but one thing that definitely helps is if if your family's financial stability is better, your chan- right. I feel like your chances of being a strength coach are better because then you can have someone help support you pay for. Absolutely. Say if uh, you want to go intern, say if uh, I applied for an internship at Stanford. That's completely across the country for me. For me to go live out in California compared to Indiana wages, um, so let's say for three months for a summer, I don't know what rent would be there, but I can tell you it's probably two times of what it is here. Right. Um, so for me, I would definitely have to save that uh, that money up if I wanted to do that myself. Now, if my family would be able to help me do that, that would give me a better opportunity to get that internship, and then that internship could, again, lead to a better possibility of maybe getting a job or a GA, um, something of that nature. And that's something that I didn't really have um, you know, both of my parents are like mid to low income family. Um, so I technically, that's why I had to work at, uh, Purdue. I, I mean, I, I worked to like eat and try to help pay for things. And, um, that's why I drove to Lowe's to basically cover my gas. So I can do this internship. I had my parents tell me I was stupid, probably more times than I could count. Um, but that's the one little thing, but I definitely understand it because there's not a whole lot of positions for strength and conditioning coaches. So it's one, it is actually one way to weed out applicants right. to an extent. You know, you may get a hundred applicants for an internship position. Um, but if only let's say half of them can afford to come after they say, okay, we would like to possibly interview you for coming. Are you still interested? And then you say, well, I don't have the financial means that drops the people off the list. But I will say that, um, I, I definitely respect the field and understand it. And the key thing is definitely going to be, to look around you as close as you can, like I did. I found Will, which is like around an hour drive away. That was feasible, and I didn't have to work my butt off to get that, and that's something I wanted. Right. Um, so you also got to weigh the, the cost-benefit ratio of the distance you're trying to go. Um, and that's something I wish I would have known coming in, because I would have taken a lot of that money that I was making at Purdue working part-time and saved that over the course of a year. And I probably would have been able to afford an internship, um, let's say, across the country, um, you know, maybe California or maybe on the East Coast or, or whatnot. Some of the big D1 schools that churn out really good strength coaches, interns, and GAs. But um, that's something that they don't tell you in school. Right. So, I mean, if that's something for anyone that would be listening or a younger person, like if you have to save up the money, start doing it that fall semester and then assess where you are at the end of the fall, you know, because you can assume well, maybe the spring is probably going to be about the same, but they're in the same duration. Will that make you – able to afford it for two to three months um, long term. And I actually did. I did 
um, interned down in North Carolina. A and T stayed down uh, down there for two and a half months, and I that, the little money that I did have, that's what I used, and that was a good learning experience. But then I couldn't afford to do that anywhere else uh, again. Yeah, absolutely. The thing that really interests me about that with the unpaid internships is I get it, and I don't really know that I have any ideas on how to fix it. Because in one sense, like you said, it, it's a financial background thing, and you're essentially pricing out your competition. Only certain types of people with a certain types of income are going to be able to take these internships. But at the same time, you know, I don't think there's a greedy strength coach on the other side who's just trying to get a bunch of free labor. That I the I don't think they can allocate the cash to pay a lot of interns. When you look at the uh, the salary of a lot of strength coaches, you know, shoot, try now imagine paying uh, just an intern. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, the the sports performance coach. It's even at um, Division One schools like Big D One, I'm talking Big Ten, you know, Pac Ten, SEC. Um, the head guys are probably making a pretty solid wage. But you may be looking at some of the um, assistance guys. You know, a lot of those guys sometimes even struggle when they get off their feet. And if you talk to uh, a lot of the guys that just, like, they manage to make things work, they'll tell you they scratched and clawed to make it. Right. And um, that, that's unfortunate because every strength coach I've ever met is incredibly passionate about the, what they do. And this is the one profession where if you're not passionate, you're not, you're not going to make it if you really want it that bad. So, um, they definitely understand it, and a lot of I would say a lot of strength coaches do try to put into that budget somewhere and somehow to help their um, interns. Um, I think one thing that I'm seeing a little bit more as I occasionally get on football scoop and stuff is it looks like some are trying to offer a little bit of help with housing or a little bit of help with food or like a meal plan for the summer. Um, well, it doesn't seem like a lot. It's definitely moving the steps in the right direction, but I, I think just with the way the field is, that's just the way it's probably always going to to be. Um, that's the way it always has been, I guess, uh, to my understanding. And uh, the key thing is just going to be able to find the ones that are local to you, that you can afford, and get some good experience. And wherever you're doing your undergrad, if the chances are they have an athletic program, they probably have a strength and conditioning program, do whatever you can to get talk to that head strength coach and um, – your foot in the door and to help, even if it can only be maybe 10, 12 hours a week because you got to work and, you know, go to class and whatnot. If you explain your situation enough, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I thought that was interesting, and uh, you see a lot of strength coaches do it, a lot of way to try to, to try to gain an edge on the competition. You had said if you had to go back, you'd get a minor in business or marketing or administration or possibly writing communications correct? Yes, that's correct. And you've seen a lot of strength coaches now really expand on the social media networks, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, it, you know, because the field is so much more, uh, so much about networking. When you said that, could you expand a little bit on you, the relevance of having that background in a, in a business or marketing or knowing something about that? Yeah, so... Um especially from an administration standpoint, if you ever want to be a head guy, I think if you're a, a strength coach that takes the time to, you know, not only get your master's in exercise physiology or, or, or what have you, whatever is going to be for your GA, let's say, um, but if you can somehow take the time to even get an MBA, that's going to give you a leg up on the competition to get that head job because you're going to actually understand the business and marketing and the administration aspect of running a team of individuals um, behind you. So uh, the financial aspects and things like that, it's a lot of stuff that interns don't really think about is like the layout of the facility, buying new equipment, um, upkeep. Like we talked about the interns, can we afford to pay the interns? Can we afford to give them anything? Can we, um, you know, where are things going to be for camp? You know, understanding the financial aspects for each individual strength coach, supplying your staff, um, when to give them raises, um, when you may need to bring someone in or take someone out, um, all that can help be educated through an MBA or some kind of business background. Um, and then a lot of, I mean, we, we definitely hear about it more on the football end of things, but everyone talks about boosters and money and how that helps improve a program and recruiting. Well, the same thing can be said in the, in the weight room 
is that if you can get those boosters or your fundraising to help give you money or any kind of support towards the strength and conditioning or sports performance program, that's going to let you get better equipment, uh, maybe re-renovate, um, you know, like we talked about, maybe have another GA on staff instead of having one, having two. If you can't have, like, one that's um, actually a coach, maybe you can bring a GA in that has a nutrition background so you can have someone that's actually learning Um, giving their education, but also telling your athletes more about the importance of nutrition and helping them plan that out. Um, All those little things of the administration side, um, I think, are very, very valuable that people overlook. And that's just in general. um, You see that almost across the board now. Even athletic directors are almost now having more MBAs than they are technically a master's because they're understanding the business administration side of things rather than just, um, I guess, leading would be the best being a leadership role. Um, and then from the marketing standpoint, like you said, there's people on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and all the social media outlets for their strength and conditioning programs. And uh, you see it on Strength and Performance Network a little bit more where they're making videos and stuff of what the football team's doing over summer. Um, that's, that's mainly to, you know, get boosters and fans excited, but to also share ideas across um, other strength coaches. That's the one great thing about this profession is that um, you do see a lot of strength coaches sharing ideas. Um, the very, very good ones and the humble people are not afraid to sit down and talk shop and share ideas. Um, you mean you do have those few that don't want to share their secrets because they think it's making their, you know, their four, three, three or something. But um, for the most part, the social media outlets are letting us share more information between each other and then helping improve our student-athlete, which at the end of the day is what counts. Yeah, a- absolutely. And I think a segue off of that that you know I think about a lot, and I think it's a big thing, especially within the fitness industry, and I don't necessarily mean just strength and conditioning coaches, but definitely with the fitness industry is – when you look at that marketing side of it and how to make yourself, you know, at, desirable to clients and whatnot, is it ever frustrating? Do you ever get frustrated when you see the success of a lot of people who don't do science-based training or at least evidence-based training and that don't even have really the background, which I, I'm not saying you have to necessarily have it. I, I, don't th- I don't think a piece of paper makes you, you know, any more credible than the other person, especially if you're just talking about facts and things that are proven in science but i think often you do see that where there's that big fitness guru that you know really didn't come up the way you came but is really enjoying a lot of success yeah i mean when i when i first started to realize that um and initially it bothered me um like you know how can how can so and so be successful with his or her youtube or instagram account but here I am, you know, like you said, and I have this degree, I have certain experiences, um, you know, I have certain based results with clients, you know, how, um, how do I not have that? And what I really kind of discovered is like, now I, I don't care. It, it doesn't bother me one bit. Um, I understand to me, I look at it, well, they do are making probably, you get those people off YouTube that literally do make a living off of it, but you get the, um, social media people that are, you know, hail the Holy Grail. They, they do sometimes put out some fair information, but I feel like their popularity comes more from their personality right. rather than the actual information they're um, distributing. So their fans are exactly that. They're fans of their personality. They're acting just like you would have fans of LeBron James or Albert Pujols or, you know, any, any other big name in a certain market. That's what happens. So it's basically, like you said, that's technically how they market themselves and while they do make money and whatnot. Um, that's their way of doing so. Now, my personal self, my integrity will not let me do that. I will not pretend to be somebody on a video, in an article, um, you know, in person that I'm not. Um, I'm definitely going to be straight up front with you. If someone asks me a question about something, I'm going to give them 100% my thoughts. I'm not going to give them the thought of somebody else just so I can satisfy their um their information that they're they're uh, trying to find just so I can make a sell. I personally can't live with that. Um, maybe that makes me a bad salesman. I don't know. Um, but from just the honest hard work and the minor marketing I do, um, I still have client bases. I have people show up, people that I work with, 
They love what they do, both online and in person. Um, so I, I really think that customer service is the one thing that matters. It's, yes, you need some minor marketing. Your name has to be accessible, but you don't have to beat it into the ground with a pulp with YouTube and Instagram, Facebook posts like, oh, come get my coaching at half price, blah, 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 blah. I think that's a big tag. I think if you're honest with yourself and you're just posting the client results that you have, that does enough marketing for you. You don't need to BS your way through a Facebook post. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think it makes you a bad salesman at all. I, I think it makes you honest. I think there's something to be said for long-term clientele, uh, something to be said for the client that keeps coming back because they've received a good product, whether that be knowledge, uh, hands-on training, or, or whatever it may be. You know, a second ago, I was telling you a story I could relate a little bit to what you were talking about, about the idea of kind of selling out. Uh, the high for me, you know, I got done with school. I got my CSCS, thought I was going to take on the world, was mistaken greatly. And I, I finally, I got a job as a personal trainer and it was at a big uh, chain gym. I won't mention the name, but I remember... You know, I, I, as high as that, as that was for me getting the CSES, it all came crashing down when the manager really wanted me to practice outside of my scope all the time. It was just all about the sell. And it was about, you know, giving people advice that I just did not have the scope to do. You know, I, I'm not a physical therapist. I really can't tell you what to do for aches and pains. I really can't help you with anything sports medicine related. I can't talk to you about, you know, blood circulation. I'm not a cardiologist. But that was the idea there, and I, and I had to leave. I, I lasted, I think, seven days. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it was a stretch. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the contracting positions I had before I actually started my um, master's program, that is actually why I ended up leaving during the middle of my master's program, was that the owner was trying to get me to do certain things to certain clients, and it's not that – what he wanted me to do was wrong. It was the population that he was wanting me to have to do it with that I thought was wrong, which he would have me work with. Uh, you know, I, I, I work very, very well with kids. I love being with kids. Um, it's, it's definitely very rewarding. I've coached um, anywhere from four to 18 year olds in wrestling. Um, and now that's what I do with pre barbell as well as I coach college kids. So, um, but he wanted me to take, you know, eight, 12 year olds and start trying to put a bar on their back and, and things of that nature. And I was not for that because I believe that, you know, you can load a child without a barbell. You know, there, there's mm. so many different implements in a gym and, you know, I'm definitely trying to teach patterning first, especially with these kids, because if you look across the board at what's wrong with children's sports performance, it's more so the movement quality than anything else. I think a lot of sports performance coaches, especially in the individualized um, realm, have good intentions. They want their kids to be good. They want them to be healthy. They want them to be strong. They just don't almost know better. And they're, they don't, when they see a kid start putting weight on an implement, they're like, oh, man, this is great because mom and dad is going to really like it, and that's going to get me to get them to continue to buy in. Right. For me, I would much rather see that squat pattern, say they can't squat for shit, if I would much rather take them from a really high box and get that box down to parallel and move the box away before I start loading it and be like, look, mom, your daughter couldn't even squat to a high box, and now we can have her doing a full squat that looks great. That's going to transfer over to the field of play, court, whatever, much better because she's going to feel better in that position when she has to be in an athletic stance. But a lot of people don't don't want to make that. They want to see the weight Um go up. So that's one thing I had issue and I just had to be up front. I said if I can't if I can't do things the way that I would like to do them, you know, you contracted me, I understand it's your gym, I understand you're giving me cuts of things, but if we can't reach a compromise, I'm going to have to step away because I personally can't do the harm to the athlete. If you want to do it, that's I guess that's okay, but I mean I don't want that under my watch. It can be under under your watch. And of course I tried to get the athlete to follow me and I did end up working with that one specific athlete that I had. Um, for longer, um, actually by myself um, and certain other public places that I talked to them, let me train that client at. Um, so I definitely do understand. I tried to make a compromise, and it just didn't work. And that's what kind of happens, especially with privatized gyms. I think it's more ego-driven. 
with Globo Gyms. It's definitely about trying to be above that bottom line so whoever your personal training manager is um, not only doesn't get ripped from his boss, but is also making a little bit more of a percentage of whatever um, it is that you're bringing in because his salary is probably based, his commission, I'm sorry, is probably based off of your commission. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's interesting, too. One of the things, like, you know, I feel a lot of us, you know, we – went after an exercise science related degree because we wanted to know more, know more about the real science behind exercise, fitness, strength and conditioning, how the body works, how muscles actually, you know, put on how to increase performance. And it's weird because you go through this process, but you go through that because you want to know and you get stuck. You don't, you're abandoning a lot of the pseudoscience of the past, but certainly the public hasn't caught up to that. And, a lot of times you're, you're kind of strong armed to going back to that pseudoscience that you, you, you were getting rid of in the first place. And I think for me, that was the frustrating part was, you know, this is why, you know, why I went after this, this field. This is why I went after this degree is because I want to know, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that, you know, the, the running regimen that you're prescribing this person is, is somehow going to, you're going to fix their ankle pain or something. That's just, out of my scope and, you know, your speaking of the manager I was under, you know, our scope of practice. And that to me was just the, the most frustrating thing. I felt like I was, uh, going down the road. I tried so hard to get away from. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, like you said, being in global gyms, you, you certainly see what other trainers are doing, especially once you've been through school, you've worked with people, you've been around the smart individuals and learn from, from the best. Um, with your online resources and, you know, watching videos and whatnot. Once once you realize that, hey, I'm stupid, these people know more than me, and I need to learn more, and you start delving into that, you also realize that you, you still don't know anything at all. But you also realize that you're leaps and bounds ahead of those global gym uh, trainers, let's say. So you almost, if you the, the, the way that I have learned with the few that I have had to work work in, is you've almost got to make a mix and match. So you've you've got to take some things that you believe in and your philosophy and what you're trying to do with your client based upon their assessments and needs and et cetera. But then you've also almost got to kind of blend in, like you said, that, that pseudo bro science kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I definitely take the time to try to keep my teach my clients, you know, good hip hinging patterns, good pressing patterns, good pulling patterns, um, and good bracing patterns around the trunk. If I can get them to do that, at the end, I may have them do something that, you know, I definitely would say is not probably towards their goals. But if I can get them to sweat, work hard, and be like, wow, that was tough, if they end the session on that note, that's what they're going to think about. They're not going to think about the 30 minutes before where they were learning on hinging technique and, you know, pulling and bracing like we discussed. They don't even think about that. But what I know is they pick something up that day because they had to learn how to do it. And then I just, I don't want to say beat them to death but, you know i actually made them sweat and they were uh, exhausted towards the end i'm completely okay with giving them 10 minutes out of that 60 to where i kicked their butt and i maybe leeway on my philosophy of hair but the other 50 minutes i took the time to make them a better um person client athlete what what have you whatever based on their goals as long as i can fix that in the 50 minutes i know that they always remember the beginning and the end so the beginning of how i present present myself, ask them how they're doing and all the personality stuff and then wrapping it up, making them work hard and say, thanks, can't wait to see you whatever day I have to next. Yeah, no, that, that, that does make a lot of sense. No, absolutely. I think, I think you're right on that. It's, uh, it's interesting to see the transition. It's interesting to see a lot of the resiliency that you, that comes from the term you used bro science. It, it seems like these two sides are almost struggling a little bit with, uh, who controls, you know, the chess pieces. Yep. Yep. That's a, that's a good, very good way to put it. Um, and I think I'll definitely say like being on the powerlifting side of things. So it's nice that we have the applicable, um, like, you know, the, I'm actually doing this stuff four days a week, you know, putting my, my heart and soul into the, the, um, activity that I enjoy, but then also have the educational background, you know, there's, there's certainly things that science will not teach you that you can't learn until you get under a bar. So there is, there is an extent to where 
quote unquote bro science does matter that you can actually understand what you can kind of apply and what you can kind of play with and tweak. And you also understand, you know, like if someone says, oh, if you um, have this shake in carbs after post-workout, nothing goes to fat. Eh, I don't know, you know. Right, <laughs> that's, no, absolutely. You know, you know, so, I mean, it's not like you can – I mean, I've heard people say, you know, they tell their clients, oh, you 30 minutes after you work out, you can go eat whatever you want. It won't go to fat. Uh, I don't know, man. I mean, if, if you eat a – Big, big whole pizza after you train. And I can't tell you that the 150 calories you just burned during a training session is going to equivalent out to a whole pizza. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I get that all the time, too. And I'm sure a lot of other people who, who come from, you know, our field of practice get that all the time, too. I always say uh, everybody wants your advice because they find out you have a, an academic background. And then once you tell them, nobody wants it anymore because they find out it's science-based. And they find out yep. usually that it's not really as appealing or, you know, it's just not as appetizing as what they had heard on maybe a YouTube channel or something else. And I get hit with that all the time where I'll tell somebody, you know, it, you know, like something as old as like turning fat into muscle. And I'm like, all right, well, you got myofibrils and you have, you know, adipocytes and they're not yep. interchangeable. You can't, they're, they're two different cells. Okay. And I get looked at, like, I just don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, well, I, I tried my best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, from what I've gathered from the people that I've talked to that are like that, um, you know, it looks like they're mainly looking for confirmation from what they heard or saw or, right. or read or, or whatever. Um, so all they're wanting to hear you do is confirm whatever they read or saw because you have that, like you said, academic background. So if they can hear the academic person and confirm it, then the um, – the YouTube guy they heard it from must be right. And when you, when you don't agree, that's when people kind of like, oh, well, that can't be right. And that's when they start getting a little defensive. Or Then that's where the, the uphill battle starts with the academic side. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. There are a couple guys out there who, who really get into it with a lot of the, oh, we'll just call them bros for now. I don't know if you ever get on like a, a Lane Norton Twitter battle, but those are very interesting to watch. I, I, I highly recommend <laughs> it if you have some free time. Get on his Facebook comments or his Twitter because he goes back and forth. And, you know, for having a, a, a doctorate, he gets told he's not fit to, to express his opinion to people all the time. It's a very interesting yeah. concept. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Blaine does a very good job of um, bridging – both both sides very well with his with his doctorate and then also his um, bodybuilding success and now more recently um, his, his powerlifting endeavors. Um, I think for me that's um, being part of Elite FTS. That's one of the things that I like the most is that not everyone is um, rooted in exercise science or um, you know the fitness field, but the ones that are not only understand the science. Um, to a pretty good degree, some actually great degrees. Um, they also practice what they're preaching. So um, even even a lot of the columnists, you know, they while they write, they also are, they're also training. I mean, they're they're bridging the gap, and it's just it's hard whenever you have the ones that um, do all the research but not the training, or the ones that do all the training and not the research. Um, so that's. That's definitely a thing that I like to see. And it doesn't matter who the individual is, as long as they're um, actually getting some time in both realms and they can they can understand and compromise between the two sides. Yeah, you know, and you brought up something kind of interesting where you talked about the balance there. And you're a guy who's got it. You know, I mentioned Lane a second ago. He does. A lot of guys do. How important do you think that is as a strength coach to have the hands-on experience? I mean – you know, in your case, you can go put the 400 plus on a squat bar and do it yourself. How important do you think that is for a strength coach to have that ability to have something almost an equilibrium between the knowledge and the physical ability? I think if you're looking at the fitness and strength conditioning realm, if if you're not training, you're doing your client a disservice or your athlete a disservice. Um, it's something. I'm not even going to say you have to compete. It's a benefit if you compete because then you keep that sports psychology side kind of clicking because whenever you're in a, a meat prep or powerlifting or you're getting ready for a bodybuilding show or even if, let's say, you do um, 
say you're playing, even, even if you're playing pickup games um, with like a church league or something, you still have, still have to be sports psychology strong. So therefore, the competition stuff kind of comes in. So that's an added benefit. But even if you don't, I still think training in the field is very beneficial. Because like you said, knowing what it feels like to put heavy weight on your back, in your hands, perform a clean, go through a fat loss phase, you know, be on low carbs, understanding um, what. Uh, certain metabolic conditioning things you might be doing or your clients are feeling. If if you don't know what that stuff feels like, having someone else do it is just very, um, very ill-minded because it's pretty much trying to make someone suffer that you never, you have no idea what it feels like. If I'm going to hire, um, if I'm going to hire, let's say a plumber, I'm definitely not only going to make sure that he knows his plumbing stuff. I definitely want to make sure if, I go in his house, he doesn't have broken spigots, his toilet's fixed, you know, all the water is running. If he, that stuff's not working in his house and he can't fix it himself, I sure as hell don't want him fixing my house. So <laughs> I like that analogy. Um, I mean, that's one way to look at it if you look at other trades. Most people that have trades they're very good at, they can also do it themselves. And I think the personal training and strength and conditioning uh, fields are the, are the exact same and um, it's it's also very motivational for a lot of clients um, to actually work with somebody that's in shape and does what they do because um, you can even share stories about it if you have them do um, say a metabolic conditioning thing you can be like oh yeah I did that three weeks ago and I was in the exact same state so I know exactly how you feel like that sucks so great work today you beat my time or you know like that's very motivational for a client or an athlete um doing things better than someone that's telling them and understands what to do. Um, They almost view it as a challenge. And um, one way to look at things, uh, Dave Tate said very well, you're usually not a good personal trainer or strength coach if you can't make the person you're working with better than you. Um, There certainly are degrees and examples to where that's tough uh, to do when you have an elite athlete to train other people. But for the most part, if you're a regular guy that just trains and works out and you can make your client bigger, stronger, faster than you, you're good at what you do. You motivated your client and um, you, you were able to have them be better than yourself. So, Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, you nailed the, I think you nailed it on the head there. It's interesting. One of the things I, w- I was thinking about it as you were going through that was uh, I can think about my own experiences. I was an intern at Portland State for a little bit and – we had, you know, we had the golf team actually running, and one of the girls was really struggling with it. And I didn't think it was a physical thing. I thought it was a mental thing. I, I really thought she was just mentally breaking down. She was kind of wincing, uh, really breathing heavy. But I, I really think it was kind of more of a mental thing. But, you know, the reason I think that is because I've been there. I've been in that situation where you really don't want to do something and you have to do it. And you know, physically you're, you're okay, but you're telling yourself that physically you're not okay. And we ended up having to take her to the AT, but it was one of those times that I realized how much my personal experience, I could kind of relate to what she was going through in that moment. And I could only kind of run, you know, rack my brain if that had been, you know, someone else in that situation who had never done that, who had never really pushed themselves to the point of, you know, mentally just looking for, looking to get out of it. Yeah, that's that's a really good way um, to to look at it, um, especially when you're looking more in the sports performance, um, collegiate and athletic setting. Um, we can't forget that those students, one, they're students. Um, that that has to be remembered. And the second thing is, this is technically not what they enjoy doing. They they are lifting one. It's probably a requirement from the sport coach. And two, they're using that to get better at what they actually do enjoy doing, which is their their sport. So like you said, that was a golf player. I don't know many golf players that like to go out and run, but I can tell you right now, if I take them to play putt-putt, they're probably going to have a hell of a time. (laughs) So, you know, understanding that and helping them push through something that really kind of sucks for the moment, but trying to make them understand, you know, persevering and then how whatever they're doing applies to making them a better athlete at what they do in that circumstance golf that's also very important yeah and i the you know on the other side of that i think the important part is too is i mean i'm sure you can relate i i definitely had you know professors that uh likely never racked up a squat bar before 
But you know what? I still got a ton out of their class, especially on the science side and on the way to do things right. And I really value, you know, the skills and the tools they gave me on the academic side. And, you know, like I said, I, I don't know that they ever had – they ventured into the weight room much, but – they, they definitely certain change my style of thinking, and I, I find that to be almost as important as the time spent under the bar. Yes, yeah. yeah I, I definitely think the academic stuff uh, it, it sets that one, that really good foundation and baseline. Um, that's really kind of what got me interested um, and got me into the actual field. I, I kind of originally wanted to start out being an athletic trainer, but then I realized I was fixing things, and that if, if I use this knowledge, I could technically prevent these things. So if I can prevent diabetes, weight loss, you know, ACL tears, shoulder problems, you know, what have you, with actual training, that's freaking awesome. That's what I want to do is prevent it, not just fix it. Now, athletic trainers also do help on the prevention side. I don't want to say they don't do that. But if you can, if the athlete is strong and doing the things that they should be to stay healthy, their chances of injury drop drastically versus if they're just, you know, going out and running, um, their body's not as a strong sort of situation. So that academic side is what fueled me to get into more of the um the actual applied side of me actually training and whatnot. And like you said, there I certainly had professors as well that were outstanding um uh, academics took a while away from their class and like you said they probably never put a squat bar on their on their back in their life. So um, that doesn't mean that they can't provide good, valuable information. You just also have to take what you know you need to be able to apply and, um, you know, cut out what stuff that you can't. So, I mean, if, if I wanted to, if they tried to tell me that, you know, squatting was bad for my knees, that's just something that I would just have to just brush over and be like, you know what, I've been squatting for 12 plus years. My knees are great, <laughs> great you know. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, you got to, like I said, take what you can. And uh, from the academic side, balance that out with whatever applied and training stuff that you um, also agree with. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Now, I know you're, you're a busy guy, and before we let you go, I want you to tell us a little bit about Smitley Performance Systems. Okay, so yeah, Smitley Performance Systems is um, my, my online business um, and how I train people as well. Um, in person, so that's, it falls under that same company. Um, I started that um, going on almost a year now. Um, being part of the LEFTS, I started to get a lot of requests for online training and programming, and I eventually gave into it. I, I turned it off for the longest time, and I finally said, you know, there's enough people that are asking for help. I'm, I'm going to do my part, but I'm going to learn the right way. I'm going to talk to some people about how they do it and educate myself went about that route and started accepting clients um, online. The majority of them are powerlifting or strength-based. Um, so those that are looking to improve their powerlifting numbers are just their overall general strength. Um, so your typical meathead guys that, you know, they're tired of, say, the cookie cutter programs are looking for something more individualized. Um, that's what I do. And I also work with a few people as well with um, nutrition, um, I do that as a case by case basis, so I'll send you the paperwork on that um, to how, so I can decide if you're going to be a good fit for me. If I feel like you're trying to do a lot, and I feel like there's much better coaches out there, I will make recommendations for who you should go see and then pass, refer them on. But if I feel like if what they want to do works well for me, then I will keep them. Um, I've only got a few nutrition people, so like I said, I'm very selective with who I like to work with in that realm. And then I also do seminars, and that's how I coach pre barbell. That's all through that system as well. Um, so I basically write the programs and coach Purdue Barbell at their powerlifting meets for their powerlifting team. Um, that's where I did my undergrad, being an alum. Um, very involved with that. We've got, I don't know, 30, 40 powerlifters, um, great group of kids to work with. They've, they've given me just as much as I've probably given them, uh, if not more. And it lets me be around the powerlifting world, which I really enjoy, um, and then along with that and Elite FTS, writing articles there, keeping my training log, Q&A, very involved on that side, very thankful for the opportunity that Dave Tate and um, that company has given me uh, on that side of things as well. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm going through the page as I'm talking to you, and it's interesting. You've got so many different links on here and so many uh, different little articles and things that people can look at, apparel. It's, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty stacked site. Yeah, I wish I could uh, keep up with it more. I would say that like with uh, Elite FTS, with my training log, uh, writing on there, um, and then my if, if anyone ever goes to my training log, for the most part, you will find a YouTube video in there. Um, I actually take the time to video almost every training session and then commentary overlay why I'm doing what I'm doing, how things felt. Um, I kind of use it for myself, so if I want to remember how that session went, not only do I have the numbers, I've got myself talking about myself, and I can be like, oh, yeah, that day really sucked. I wonder why that was, and then the overlay will let me know. But at the same time, people also take away some stuff. And I train out of a two-car garage with um, – some really good OESS equipment, but I mean, there's certainly not global gym stuff. So I do get pretty creative with some of the ways that I try to uh, hit certain muscle groups for uh, training. Um, but then also people like to see um, what it's like to hit uh, certain lifts and meat prep and stuff like that. And like you said, um, so the actual website, I do try to update it around once a month if I can. Um, but otherwise, majority of my stuff is, so if you go over to OESS, you can keep up with all that there for sure um that's where you'll definitely find probably the majority of my activity awesome awesome well uh brandon we know you're a busy guy we're gonna let you go but is there anything you want to plug before you take off here is there any way with the the common people can get in touch with you yeah um you have a few options you can go to my website brandonsmelly.com there's a little contact link there's a little thing you can fill out there that will go, that will bounce to my business email. There's also a services section so you can see what I have to offer service wise. If any, if that would happen to interest you, then there's also a submission portion on that to where you fill out your name, your email address, what you're kind of looking to do. And that bounces to me so that I can briefly see what you're looking uh, to accomplish. And like I said, those services range from online programming and training. So the two differences are if you just need a program, if you need something written, um, but you don't need like any kind of coaching. So meat preps work really well in that for people that are powerlifting and know what they're doing or people that just look for a different routine, but have a very good bath knowledge of their weight room. Um, that's a good route to go. The other one's more individualized to where, um, that aspect comes to me looking at YouTube videos every week, much more interaction. Um, the idea there is to basically almost be your personal trainer through online but at the same time help you create for a meet or what, whatever your goals may be. And like I said, there's also some nutrition things that I offer, which I don't actually put on the service site um, because I do it case by case. Um, that kind of lead up people that I work with to an extent. Um, and then, like you said, I'm, um, I'm also over on EliteFTS.com. You can shoot me a Q&A over there, um, and I will eventually get to it. I'm usually pretty good at checking it about every other day. Um, and then all my social media stuff, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and, uh, pretty, pretty much it, I think. Um, so that, and then, um, occasionally I write things for my supplement sponsor, NutriBio, but, um, if you're ever interested in something from them, just let me know and then I can give a referral code through email or something like that. All right. Well, we're definitely going to make sure to include all those links in the description, so if people want to get in contact with you, have a Q&A, or look at any of your uh, training services, they'll have an easy contact for you. Brandon, yeah, definitely. we greatly appreciate you calling. Uh, you're doing us a huge favor by this, and we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Awesome, Brandon. Well, I think you're you're probably going to hit the snooze here pretty soon. You're about three hours ahead of me, and it's yeah. seven, it's 7 over in the West. So sorry to keep you so late, but uh, sincerely, we appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Have a good one. Thank you, too. Take care. Well, and that concludes our podcast for the day. Brandon Smitley. Dang, he sure knows an awful lot. It was, it was hard to keep up with him at times because I was just processing the things he was saying. It was like I, I wanted to ask a question, but I had to think about what he said, and uh, that's why we had him on because he knows an awful lot, and he's a cool guy to, you know, get inside his brain for a little bit and know a lot more about the field. And if you want to know a little bit more, go ahead and send Brandon a tweet. Send him a little tweet. His Twitter account is supergoodsmito. That's at supergoodsmito. Smito spelled 
S M I T T O. His company that he talked about there was Smitley Performance Systems, and that's brandonsmitley.com. His last name Smitley, spelled S M I T L E Y. And if you ever want to read his articles, you know, his article was, it was the motivation for having him on. That, that's how I found out about him, was just reading one of his articles off EliteFTS.com, the uncertainty of an exercise science degree. So make sure you go over there and check out some of his articles because uh, they're really good. Well, that's all I've got for you today, guys. So you'll have to join back in for my next podcast, and we're going to try to razzle-dazzle you again. Try to give you guys some fun to give you something to listen to. For Northwest Strength Science, Christopher Lincoln Evans, out.